This is a University of Otago podcast. Okay, I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Jesse Baring to the Distance Learning Symposium today. Jesse is leading the, um, a new program that is about to start next year, Postgraduate Diploma in Science Communication at a distance. So uh, welcome, Jesse. Thank <laughs> you. you. Thank you for your patience. That'll teach me to use Keynote, I think, in the future. It's a little bit more complicated than I was anticipating, but thank you for organizing that. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this new program. It's actually it's the certificate degree in postgraduate science communication. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our department. Not only are, are we a new distance degree offering, um, but also we are a brand new department, actually. We were the Center for Science Communication, and we, we still go by that name, the Center for Science Communication, but we are officially a department now. We've moved away from zoology, and we have our own um, departmental status. We've moved to a new building. We were in that really horrific building um, on Great King Street that, they've, that used to be a morgue that they've demolished, and now that's where they're building the new um, animal research facility. Now we've moved to um, uh, um, East Union Street, Union Street East. Um, so we're in the Atheo building over there. What we do at the Center for Science Communication is to train um, prospective science communicators in several different streams or different areas. We've got a writing program, we've got a film program, um, and we've got what we call a science and society program, and that's for uh, people that want to work in places like this, museums or for nonprofit uh, organizations, um, to somehow translate difficult, esoteric, challenging um, science to the general public. Um, what I'll be talking about today, and what we've developed over the past year or so in terms of getting this new distance degree up and running, um, is focused specifically on the writing program. Um, so we're only offering this new distance certificate um, with a specialization in science writing. So there are lots of uh, people out there, including professional scientists, people that have been in the field for um, decades even, that are, that are sort of lost in the vernacular or the jargon of their own discipline. They're sort of in the bubble of their own uh, research enterprise. But nevertheless, they want to break through. They want to somehow communicate in an entertaining, um, interesting, uh, fashion that is accessible to people that aren't experts in, in those areas. I think I'm a, I'm a case in point. Personally, my background, um, uh, originally my training was is in developmental psychology um, and published, you know, I, I was originally part of the psychology department at the University of Arkansas, then I moved to Queen's University in Northern Ireland in Belfast. I was part of a research group there, but it was all very traditional academic research, um, publishing in um, specialized peer-reviewed academic journals and going to conferences and talking to basically 10 people in the world that understood what we were, what I was doing. Um, but nevertheless, I thought, I thought that there was interesting stuff there and I wanted to, I wanted to speak to more people. I was doing my research in um, uh, children's belief in uh, God and the afterlife. So things that I thought were quite fascinating, but nevertheless, um, I was only talking to a very specific contingency of researchers in, in the discipline of the cognitive science of religion, in my case. So I started writing articles. I started writing for Scientific American, for Slate magazine, um, uh, and a couple other places. I wrote a book, a popular science book, and I realized that's really, really where my passion lied. It was, um, I still was an academic, and I wanted to do the academic research, but I wanted to also um, write in a way that um, other people could really sort of appreciate the work that I was doing. And I knew a lot of other researchers felt that way as well, other academics. They wanted to talk about the work, they were passionate about it. Um, but there were very few programs sort of catering to people that wanted to develop a career in science communication that were also academically oriented. There were plenty of journalism programs, um, but very few that had that sort of appreciation for science and also storytelling. And that's what we are. We are the Center for Science Storytelling. So there are loads of prospective students and researchers out there that have a passion um, for communicating science, but um, we want to give them the algebra, how to actually put together a coherent story, uh, a story that is going to resonate with a broad audience. And this is one of my favorite quotes by uh, Borges, art is fire plus algebra 
So lots of people out there have that um, fire, they've got the passion, but they don't really know how to put a good story together. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to uh, teach them. So to engage the audience, passion alone or the fire isn't enough. One must also be able to effectively exploit the cognitive mechanisms. This is where the psychology comes in, or give them the algebra uh, underlying every good story. So there's a myth, I think, out there that um, if you're a good writer, you don't really need any sort of proper training in the field of science communication. Uh, this sort of beautiful writing trumps all. But in reality, um, it's much more important to be a good storyteller than it is to be a good writer. So if you've just got this sort of native talent for good writing skills, um, that's really not going to take you very far. What we're trying to do um, with, with our students is to uh, teach them the, the algorithm, the logistics of writing a good story, um, in addition to lots of other sort of uh, uh, practical skills in the field. So learning to write well is not synonymous with learning to write a story, and of the two, writing well is secondary. We like to um, teach our students that uh, narrative nonfiction is sort of best conceived uh, in the dramatological um, sort of uh, framework, looking at a good science story as basically a play, a scene-by-scene -scene construction. So all stories, all good stories are a series of scenes, um, and they exploit these psychological characteristics that all human beings are operating with. So they should stimulate existing memories, they should uh, have conflict and emotion. We tell our students to find a problem out there in the world. If you can find the problem, then you've got a good story. Something really sort of juicy to latch on to. Um, people like drama, they like conflict, they like characters, they like emotionally rich content. Um, the science itself doesn't sell from a storytelling perspective. You've got to embed it somehow in a really juicy narrative. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Uh, and the details in, in these scenes should connect to a larger point. Um, the books I've written, for instance, uh, lots of, a lot of this sort of uh, or, or early uh, editorial feedback that I got was, okay, that's interesting, you know, just sort of a whistle-stop tour of all the interesting science, but what's your point? What's the moral of the story? What are you trying to tell the readers? Um, so, before I tell you sort of the logistics of the distance program that we've developed, here's just an example of the sort of storytelling that, that um, we try to encourage our students to find uh, or, to, or to develop and, um, and build. This is a, a, a story that I came across. Um, I, I found a, um, an obscure article in the science literature as a psychologist. It was about, I was writing a piece about um, uh, the, the person who basically was the first to diagnose autistic disorder. And uh, his name was Leo Connor, and he was interesting in, in, in his own right. But um, he was at Johns Hopkins University at the time, and he was um, attached to this, uh, what was called an insane asylum at that point, near Baltimore, called the Rosewood um, uh, Center. And he discovered there was this really sort of nefarious scheme where uh, a lot of the, the resident patients, uh, girls and women primarily, and some of these women had been there for 30, 40 years, they were um, seriously developmentally delayed, um, major mental uh, disorders of all diff different varieties, including um, autism. But they were being unscrupulously um, farmed out to wealthy people in the, in this, in the city of Baltimore um, under the pretense of adoption, that somehow you know, these wealthy families were going to give them homes and raise them and, and teach them how to function in society. And, give them love and, and support. But in reality, what they were doing was using them as um, domestic servants. Uh, they were exploiting them for their slave labor. And a really sort of horrific story, you know, these, these, these girls and women that just had never been outside of this facility now found themselves scrubbing toilets in these rich families' homes. And um, then when the families realized that they were completely unprepared to um, uh, support them, and to give them the appropriate sort of family life that they needed. They kicked them out of the house, they ended up on the streets, they became prostitutes. I mean, it was just a really horrific story. 
but it was a story. It was a good story because it illuminated um, what was happening at the time in terms of uh, all sorts of co controversies about eugenics and, and insane asylums and uh, the origins of autism and so on. So that's what I say, that's what we try to do. We try to teach students to look for a good story and then you will illuminate the science that um, was unfolding. This is one example of many. I'm a psychologist, so of course, this is, what I, this is the area that I would gravitate to. Um, at the Center for Science Communication, um, we've got multiple different postgraduate degrees. Um, and the one that we've developed for the distance course is this top one, the Certificate in Science Communication. But we also offer a diploma. Um, we offer a Master's of Applied Science and then the full Master's of Science Communication. Actually, one that's not even here is that we have a PhD program as well. All of these I would consider to be um, for people that are training to be practitioners in the field, primarily practitioners in the field of science communication. The PhD program is for academics that basically want to uh, do research in the science of science communication. These are people that actually want to be in university departments talking about the discipline of science communication. Um, but so we're only offering at the moment the distance degree um, in uh, uh, science communication the certificate in science communication with the writing stream itself. And this was our new announcement um, uh, for this new program that's going to be launching next year. We've had great response so far um, from students all over the world. Um, it's really attractive, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, students can be doing this part time. Um, and uh, we're going to be you know, it's sort of a work in progress, but we're going to be using Blackboard primarily. Um, because the three papers that are connected to the certificate are also part of our existing master's degree, it's a dual, a dual mode sort of course offering. So we've got um, a paper in, the, in storytelling, we've got a paper in creative nonfiction writing, and then we've got an internship that we're offering, and these are all part of the distance degree. Um, because uh, of time constraints, we've decided not to do a live feed or do a um, uh, sort of the synchronous offering um, for the distance students, but to upload the, the lectures and the, uh, the survey course content through Blackboard for students to watch at their leisure. Um, but most of the assignments are modified versions of what the students would be doing on campus. Um, so the writing assignments, the feedback, um, and so on. Are, uh, there's a contingency of students on campus that are doing the same thing. Um, so we're quite excited about it. Ultimately, what I'd like to do is um, open this up, not only, you know, not, not market this to um, the international prospective science writing community, but, but more specifically tailor it to Otago um, students. Um, the Division of Sciences is wide ranging, so I think um, to have a certificate um, along uh, this sort of specialization in science communication alongside a PhD, for instance, in uh, geology or chemistry, physics, psychology, um, would be a tremendous asset for um, uh, uh, new academics entering the job market. That's it. Thank you very much. Jesse? Do we have some questions? Yes. Hang on. Could you just? <laughs> I think that's a great um, angle to be going for the science, the people that are studying science now. And I was just wondering how you, I mean, I, I, I live in Wellington. I'm at the Wellington yep. Medical School, so I don't even know how this campus works at all. So I was just wondering how you've been sort of reaching out to the Division of Science. Um, see, I don't even know these terms. So um, yeah, if I just wanted to hear how you've been, how you feel about that. Well. Um, we haven't really had a, like a concentrated campaign effort to target um, the, the Division of Sciences at the University of Otago, but that, that is something that we're working on. We were thinking, and we still are thinking more broadly at the moment in terms of just attract, because there are only, um, in terms of our, our background research and putting this together, there are only about four um, competitive distance programs in the world that offer anything even remotely like this. Um, so there's a, there's a market out there, I think, more broadly speaking, but also, you know, tailored to what I would love to see is like a PhD um, uh, alternative that, that, that includes a certificate in science communication. 
Um, so it's only, I mean, it's only the equivalent of, it's three papers, you know, it, over the course of a three-year PhD, I think it's very doable part-time. But getting, getting this under your belt and some evidence to show how useful it is, successful and all of that kind of thing could be the beginnings of making a case that can be convincing because you always have to, yeah. of course, convince, have lots of evidence to convince the, uh, the powers that be, as it were. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Tim. To what extent is what you're offering transferable outside of science? So, you know, philosophy communication or history communication? Um, I hadn't, I mean, I haven't really spent much time thinking about it, but, but I would imagine it's quite transferable. You know, it, it would have to, it couldn't be science communication, obviously, but it would, there would be, com there should be comparable programs in terms of, um, you know, effectively communicating difficult uh, material, esoteric sort of academic material to the general audience. Um, but that's a great that's a great question. I think it's it's it is applicable, and I think it's um, it makes sense. Because you, you could broaden your market um, to any academic who wants to make their work accessible to the public. Um, yeah, I see, I see the logic to that. I mean, I I think you know we are we are a staff of scientists, and um, I think there would be a danger of uh, diluting our expertise in some sense by mm. treading into territory that we're not as comfortable with, but, but I see your point. Mm. Can you tell us how you're doing the inter professional internship uh, for distance students? Um, it's going to be, and it needs to be incredibly flexible. We already have an internship program for the on-campus version of, the, of these, um, these courses, so the distance version is definitely going to be much more complicated. We've got um, I think a, a fairly wide network of contacts out there in the industry. Um, and I envision, for instance, um, uh, internships uh, as editorial assistants at you know, popular science magazines like Scientific American, for instance, or Cosmos or National Geographic. Um, you know, maybe students that are uh, fielding queries at science um, liter literary agencies, um, working, doing promotional material for uh, for this museum or other museums. Um, so I think it's just going to be a matter of fit and availability and working with the student and getting that organized pretty early in the program. So they can start the internship either, it's basically a year long program because we offer, of the three papers, the two are offered in different semesters. So they can't cram it all together into one semester even if they wanted to. Um, but they can start the internship either the first semester or the second semester or do it part time over the course of the year. So there's plenty of time, I think, to work that out with the students. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you. Thanks for coming along.